Welcome back to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I am your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. Welcome back, everyone. Today, I am introducing a short new series in collaboration with Gary Stevens of the History in the Bible podcast. This series is bittersweet because it represents the last set of episodes on Gary's podcast. I am incredibly honored to be a part of Gary's podcast swan song for this series. In this series, Gary developed a number of speculatory scenarios where, if a few events went differently, the trajectory of Christianity may have changed markedly. We talk about the history of academic speculation and counterfactual history, how that particular approach is quite controversial for some quite good reasons, but shouldn't be completely discarded either. Plus, how speculating on history is just plain fun. I know you enjoy it. I enjoy it. I would dare to say anybody who is a fan of history enjoys speculating. So with that approach in mind, nothing we said on these topics is at all exhaustive. We would love to hear your thoughts on our speculations and your own speculations on these topics. There could be very well some follow-up episodes based on your speculations and your feedback on our speculation. So be sure to send those in. I will wrap up this series inside of the History of the Papacy podcast with a few episodes on topics suggested by audience members like you. If you have a potential episode topic, I'd love to hear it. And if you become a patron on patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy at the Constantinople or Rome levels, Among many other benefits, you will get to commission episodes that I will guarantee will get produced. With that, I hope you enjoy these speculation episodes. Definitely go over and listen to all of the episodes on Gary Stevens' History in the Bible podcast and go over and wish him well. Worry not, this will not be the end of Gary's podcasting career. He has many collaborations planned with other podcasters, and he will continue to be a fixture on the History of the Papacy podcast for many years to come. With that, here is the next piece in the mosaic of the History of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. For the last few episodes of my main narrative, I will entertain you with some speculations. I will explore some paths that early Christianity and rabbinic Judaism could have travelled down. I have prepared a set of 16 fascinating alternative history scenarios. These will be discussed in order of their divergence from our timeline. The first scenario is set in about 30 CE AD. The final one is set in the year 380. Alternative histories are sometimes called allo-history or euchronias, or what-ifs. There are two distinct ventures. First, novels and stories. And the second, academic essays by professional historians. The latter are usually called counterfactuals. The entertaining what-ifs are written by fiction authors. These writers posit a divergence point from our timeline and let their imaginations run wild. They are free to invent events and characters in their imagined history and to carry their stories far beyond the point of divergence, for hundreds of years in many cases. Alternate histories are a subgenre of literary fiction or science fiction or historical fiction. Take your pick. The earliest examples come from way back in the 1830s. 
they became a staple in the emerging mass market for science fiction from the 1920s. Some of the most popular stories begin with military divergence points. The Nazis winning the Second World War, the South winning the American Civil War. Others make more subtle tweaks. What if Mirabeau had not died young during the French Revolution and had instead succeeded in establishing a constitutional monarchy? One of the most famous stories is one of the oldest, a yarn called If Lee Had Not Won the Battle of Gettysburg, first published at the beginning of the Great Depression in 1930. You could call it a reverse alternate history. The author was, can you believe it, Winston Churchill. Winston had turned to literary pursuits, while his party was languishing out of power in the United Kingdom. Churchill writes as someone living in a world where Lee's victory produced an American South and North that became separate and amicable republics. After Lee's abolition of slavery, the two eventually joined with the United Kingdom to form the world's most powerful political entity. This Anglo-Saxon polity prevented a regional war in Europe, the one we know as the First World War. In an unusually prescient vision, Churchill describes how this encouraged a European Union that produced global prosperity and peace. He concludes his story with an alternate history, in which Lee loses the battle, and the Great Union never materialises. Churchill projects the next 60 years of history to end in a world of economic misery and political turmoil. As with many alternate history authors, Churchill is making some heavy-duty political statements here. The not-so-fun alternate histories are written as essays by professional historians. They prefer to call their works counterfactuals. The historian assumes that some specific event never occurred, the counterfactual, and then investigates the short-term consequences of that. The historians have no interest in following the novelists and spinning yarns about imaginary long-term effects. They are focused on the importance and impact of the negated event. Just how important was this event? Counterfactuals are not so much a matter of what happened in the past, but the disagreement about which past events were most significant. Counterfactual contemplations go as far back as the Greek historian Herodotus and the Roman historian Livy, who pondered if Italy could have survived an invasion by Alexander the Great. But they remained as parenthetical interrogations, or mere questions. Scattered collections of essays began to appear in the 1930s, about the same time as alternate history fiction took off. I've read a lot of these essays. They are dull and dreary. The historian, an expert in their topic, spends 90% of the essay parading their knowledge about the event. At the very end of the essay, they bring out their counterfactual what-if. They conclude either that the what-if could not possibly have occurred, or, if it had done so, nothing much would have changed. How boring. Most Western historians regard counterfactuals as perhaps entertaining, but with no utility, since they do not illuminate the past. Counterfactuals, they say, do not have sources that can be interrogated, and endeavour at the heart of the historian's job. If counterfactual history has found little purchase in the West, it has proved popular in other places. It thrives in Indian universities, who are ever interested in asking what India would have been without the Raj. The invariable answer is, much better off, thank you. Take that East India Company. The few Western advocates of counterfactual history respond that all historical statements contain implicit counterfactual claims. To state that some military decision won a war implies it's counterfactual, that without the decision the war was lost. 
These historians argue that counterfactuals serve to establish causes and to test hypotheses. They also argue they are a powerful counter to determinism, in which the historian paints events as inevitable and ineluctable products of greater forces. For these very assertions, leftist Western historians are no fans of counterfactuals, especially those collections of essays produced in recent decades by their frenemies on the right. The progressives hold that counterfactuals downplay social structures and economic conditions and promote the great man theory of history. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History podcast and many other great shows. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. I could not produce these final episodes without my old chum, Steve Guerra of the History of the Papacy podcast, and many other podcasts. Steve was the man who got me started in podcasting, and encouraged me from the very beginning, nine years ago. We have collaborated on so many shows, on this and other podcasts, that I have lost track. He has been a wonderful colleague, and he makes delicious honey. In this episode, Steve and I ruminate on the first two of my scenarios. Scenario number one. What if John the Baptist had been bigger than Jesus? Scenario the second. What if Paul the Apostle had split from the Jerusalem Jesus Club and founded his own independent movement? I see that Steve is in the house. Let's begin. Okay, Steve, now how are you today? I am great. How are you, Gary? I am just tickety-boo. Now, let's launch into the first of the speculations, alternate history timelines. I've got a bunch of them, and we're going to be going through the scenarios in order of their divergence from our timeline. So let's start with the first scenario. What if John the Baptist had been bigger than Jesus? What would have happened to Christianity? Would Christianity have gotten off the ground at all? Would John the Baptist's movement have become, well, a type of Christianity? From Josephus, we know that John the Baptist was fairly widely known, very popular, and regarded as a very righteous man. Josephus only makes one small reference to Jesus, and that quite possibly could be a Christian interpolation. So the Baptist seems to have been very popular. If anyone could have launched some sort of uh, religious movement, it would have been him. Any ideas of, let's say that John isn't killed by the Herodians, and he goes on to found this movement. Do you think it would have basically been an alternative Christianity? I think that's a really interesting one because, I mean, it's the earliest, it's even before really the Jesus movement even. I think that the some of the questions I had was the Mandeans of today are supposed, could be a, a remnant of the John the Baptist sect. And if you use those as your basis for the jumping off point, they're a, uh, an ethno, oh, I'm blanking on the word. They're, uh, they can only marry within their group. And that's the only way that they promulgate their group is by genetically being, ethnically being, whatever that group. So if they had stuck with that, maybe John the Baptist sect is too too insular, maybe a little too Gnostic, and it never could catch fire amongst the, the pagans and the Greco-Romans to really catch on. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, John the Baptist was delivering a similar message to Jesus, an apocalyptic one, but there's no evidence from what we know about him that he was going to strike out and talk to the Gentiles, is there? It would have had to have taken off within Judaism, Hmm. and there's a lot of firewalls inside of Judaism 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees, where I think that it would have been really tough to just completely convert everyone to John the Baptistism. It was, I think that it was that, and then the Samaritans, was he reaching out to Samaritans? Was he reaching out? It doesn't seem that way to me, but I guess we don't really know enough. Yeah, John died too early, didn't he, really, for us to know much. Let's say John does, he lives longer and does develop some sort of movement. He's not killed by the state, and there's also a a Jesus movement. I wonder if they would have, would, would they have coalesced? Would they have, well, well, actually, for all we know, they did. Yeah. There's the possibility that, that John's following, they, they did become Christians, followers of Jesus. And that's sort of a bit suppressed in the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament clearly thinks that John is a holy man, and it could easily be, be interpreted that uh, Jesus is John's inferior because he is baptised by the Baptist. So maybe it could have been the reverse. The Jesus movement was incorporated into the Baptist movement. And we basically wouldn't know, in a, in a sense. The, the end product would have been the same. But yeah, as you say, there's the issue of the mission to the Gentiles. Paul had joined that? Hmm, good question. I wonder too if maybe the John people were the more Jewish leaning of Jesus' yeah. followers. Was John from Galilee? Uh, where does it say that Mary goes to see Elizabeth in? Where does she go to visit? Do they say where she goes? I don't know. I just thought of that. I should have looked that up. Well, right now, Elizabeth's husband was a priest, wasn't he? Yeah, where did they live? And which Gospels was that in? I'm pretty sure it would be Jerusalem. Which is the one that has his full... Is that in Luke? Yeah. Yeah, is it Luke or Matthew? John's birth announcement to... You know, we would probably have to do a little bit more of a deep dive into that. But uh, I... Oh, wait, Christ's birth. Oh, and now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent, oh, wait, blah, 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 a little bit further, Christ's announcement. Okay, so this is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 39. Mary visits Elizabeth. Now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. Oh, so that's interesting. Maybe... John was more of a Judah kind of guy. and Yeah. And it's interesting that she goes to the hill country because all the activity is really on the, on the Mediterranean plain. The hill country is the backwatery bit of the entire thing. So Luke doesn't actually give a town or a place. No. Well, that's a bit mysterious. I was wondering, and I wonder what you thought of this, is maybe maybe John does say, let's let's say that John, subs- Jesus never, his group never really gets, starts on fire, and they just sort of fade out or meld into the John the Baptist movement. Does John the Baptist movement just be another, become another sect of many in Judaism, Second Temple Judaism, and then they would more than likely throw their lot in with the rest, and then they just get pretty much wiped out, or maybe they become the survivor, unlike the Pharisees. I mean, I think that's getting a little bit farther away in a counterfactual, but, I mean, that's a possibility. That, I, th- I think that's a definite possibility. What if they had been the surviving movement, or a major surviving movement? I suppose it's an issue of, I mean, one of the driving forces behind the Jesus movement is that Jesus comes to be thought of as the Messiah, the Son of God. As he is depicted in the New Testament, John is depicted as the precursor. He explicitly says, from what I remember, there is one coming after me who will be greater. So let's assume that that theology carries, carries through in the Baptist movement. Well, I suppose that could keep going, couldn't it? Because the one who's going to come after me, he doesn't say if it's tomorrow or a thousand years from now, mm-hmm. any more than modern Christians. Uh, I mean, 
a lot of Christians at the time thought that Jesus was coming back as the Messiah real soon. Paul certainly did. So I suppose where Jesus did become very strongly identified with the future Messiah, in John's movement, John is not associated with the future Messiah, but he is the prophet of the Messiah. But how that, how that would go theologically... Uh, and you don't ever get the sense that they're a dynamic duo, that they're working together, even though they're essentially the same age. John would only have been a few months older than Jesus. They're not working together except at the baptism. You don't even get any idea that they like each other or that they know each other. Really, I think one of the Gospels, John the Baptist doesn't even recognize who Jesus is. No idea. It's just another guy in the crowd getting baptized. Take your ticket, have some water, bye. One of the other Gospels says, yeah, he explicitly recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. But certainly, yeah, they're not a dynamic duo. It's clear in the text that they wanted to connect themselves to the baptizers' movement. Absolutely. It, it's, in fact, it seems to have given the first big kickoff to the Jesus movement, doesn't it? Associating him with John the Baptist. Well, I would maybe conclude this, this scenario with, as you said, maybe John the Baptist thing just remains an internal Jewish matter and we can't really predict what would have happened. Would the Jewish establishment have eventually squashed it? Would the Roman establishment have eventually squashed it? What if John had never said, you know, something to the effect of, oh, I'm the king of the Jews or I'm the king of Israel, and he just dealt in a, an apocalyptic theology and the Roman, which the Romans would not have found threatening. So he's allowed to continue, and maybe the movement flourishes and becomes a major movement in Judaism like the Pharisees and Sadducees or the Essenes, maybe it just dies away. Oh, wait, do you have a moment? A great way to support the History of the Papacy podcast is by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes such a long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable and on the air for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the History of the Papacy Diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in the order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you will be on the lists of the History of the Papacy patrons. Now, here's a brief message from our sponsors. All right, Steve, the second scenario. Let's say Paul is as in our timeline, an initial fan of Jesus. But eventually he splits from the Jerusalem Jesus movement. Now, in our timeline, he does retain strong connections to the Jerusalem Jesus Club and certainly never sees himself as fundamentally different to them, although he often has you know, conflicts with them. He takes Peter to task at least once. But what if Paul said, OK, Jesus is the man, but those guys in Jerusalem, no. Nah. I'm going to split off and found my own movement, as Marcion did about a century later. So this would make the definitive split with the Jews round about, say, the year 50 to 65, rather than it seems to have been in our timeline round about the year 120. And, and Paul, of course, is talking to the Gentiles. I wonder what would have happened then. One of the things that I thought about was this is probably one of the hardest ones of uh, scenarios that you propose to wrap your mind around because it is so radically different than what happened. Paul's movement probably would have evolved into something very different and just faded away if he became a something of a Marcionite. 
But I was thinking that maybe the Jewish clubs or the Jerusalem clubs, Jesus clubs, would have maybe they would have made a really big impact on post Second Temple Judaism after the revolts. Like, let's say they survived it. They had something they had. They could have tapped in. They were starting to create something with the Jesus that was a not temple based worship system. Maybe they would have done something like combining temple worship with synagogue worship to making something like the church. And Jesus, they pretty much stay in Judaism. Maybe they become the mainstream, or maybe there's two streams of Judaism that come out, something of the proto-rabbinical and something of the Jesus Christianity light, where Jesus is not the Trinity, not any of that, but just an elevated person, which that's presumably what they believed. So they're Jewish pretty much in every sense of the word, except they have a slightly different worship service that diverged from rabbinical Judaism. Yeah. And they have Jesus as their big guy. Maybe even proto-rabbinical Judaism wouldn't have seen Jesus as such a problem if he hadn't been brought, you know, the proto-Orthodox hadn't founded the Pauline, you might say, Christianity, didn't put him at such a high level. That's a point. In As Judaism developed, yeah, Jesus may have come to be seen as the equivalent of one of the great rabbis or something. So he'd be, he talked about, he'd be talked about like Rabbi Akiva today and that sort of thing. But assuming he had no sort of theology involved with it, he'd be probably in the Jerusalem club, he'd be seen as a great teacher. One of, one of the very earliest, I suppose. And meanwhile, Paul has gone off to the Gentiles. He still uses Jesus as a figure, although he could have latched on to John the Baptist, really. I mean, the... The Pauline Christianity did develop pretty independently of the Jerusalem Christianity. And the pagans that Paul attracted weren't interested in Jesus as the saviour of the Jews. They were interested in Jesus as the saviour of mankind. So it seems to me Pauline's mission would be essentially unchanged. His theology would probably be essentially unchanged. Because from what I recall... Paul does say that Jesus was born of the house of David, but there's not much, you know, Jewishness there. Sorry, well, he does. Ins- Paul does insist that Jewish followers of Jesus must follow the law, but if there are no Jewish followers of Jesus, well, the law does, it, it's just out of the question. So it seems to me, had Paul gone on his own way with the Gentile mission, the connection to Judaism would be eventually lost completely or suppressed or just unimportant. And one good thing to come out of that, I think, is that relations between Christianity and Judaism would have been much better. It seems that way, that Paul's thing would have been very different. It would have probably evolved into something that Jews just wouldn't have even recognized as remotely Jewish or remotely Second Temple Jewish. I mean, it could have been that Jesus even became downplayed in in his religion or not been viewed as as God, but as something different. I think that would, if there would have been a really definitive cleaving between Paul's missions and the Jerusalem clubs, you would have just, I would imagine you'd see something very different between the two of them. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Evolving Judaism and proto-rabbinic Judaism would just, it would, it, it would not have seen Paul's shiny new religion as having really anything to do with them, except, oh, there's this guy who died a while ago, and he happened, he happened to be Jewish. The conflict really came in is that the rabbinical Jews or the proto-rabbinical Jews saw the Jesus movements as heretical. Yeah. So they thought of themselves as the same religion, but not thinking in the right way. Yeah. And so that really cooked up the bad blood. And then the years where Judaism was licit, but Christianity was bounced between being illegal and kind of in a gray zone. But if Paul had gone his own way and his movement was never regarded as heretical for the simple reason it wasn't regarded as having anything to do with Judaism, 
It's kind of a jump, a leap, but do you think that Paul's movement would have survived very long or would it have become something like Manichaeism or just another mystery cult of many mystery cults? I think it would have for the reason that Paul's movement really did quite well without much input from the Jerusalem fans of Jesus at all in our timeline. So whatever Paul did, however he made it appealing, he seems to have done it well, by himself or with, with other missionaries, etc. I think it would have survived for the reason that he did in our timeline. And if there is a big split early on around about the year 50 AD CE, I can't see that changing really the course of Christian evolution that much. I can't, ch- I can't see it making Christianity any, any less successful. You could really point it to a certain point, too. The real point of divergence would have been at the Council of Jerusalem in the Book of Acts, chapter 15, if I'm not mistaken. But that would have been the point of divergence. If they had come and said, you know, we're going all in and you either have to be completely for the law or you can't be a Christian, then that's probably the point where Paul would have taken his ball and gone home. Yeah, <laughs> Or not, and then you, it, one way or the other, you'd get a similar outcome. And if Paul had taken his ball and gone home, we would probably have never heard of the Council of Jerusalem. And actually thinking about it, we probably, geez, what would have happened to the Gospels? Obviously, we'd still have Paul's letters, but it depends who wrote the Gospels, doesn't it? I mean, would anyone have written Gospels? Would some would totally different people have written Gospels? Oh, man, there's a thousand questions arrive, arise at every point. Yeah, that, that opens up a huge can of worms. I think it would have been pretty much like Marcion's movement, and Marcion had all of Paul's letters, and I think a watered down or a slightly changed Gospel of Luke. I think basically had Paul gone off by himself, he creates Marcionism a century before Marcion did. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Hey, before we go, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have, at the Alexandria level, Roberto, William B., Brian, Christina, Augustus, Judy, and Max. At the Constantinople, we have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, all of whom are magnificent and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great, Amma the Great, Geoffrey the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jim the Great. With that, I hope you enjoy this next piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. Oh, 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 oh,